we all know this passage pretty well, and for a number of us, this will have been, or maybe still is, a, a favorite. It's one that we learned in Sunday school and had read to us, or read many times, but the kids' version really misses the point of the chapter, which is, how should a Christian live when the state becomes God? Now, you can understand your Sunday school teacher might not have gone through that with you, or it's not going to be in most storybook Bibles, but this is what this chapter is all about. How do you live when the state becomes God? And perhaps that doesn't feel very relevant. We don't live in North Korea. It might have been a little bit more, had a bit more gravity to it if Andrew and Kate were here ne- this week rather than, rather than next week. But um, what do we do as safe, democratic Kiwis? What do we take from Daniel chapter 3? Bill English isn't about to demand that we all go to Mackenzie country and worship a statue representing New Zealand. By God's grace, the state isn't about to become God. But there are times where the state legislates on moral issues that have no reference to God. Where it ignores what God says in its word, where it goes its own way, promotes itself above God. Where the government essentially takes God's place and decides what is right and wrong. And so they debate legislation on abortion and euthanasia. There's growing pressure to endorse a whole spectrum of genders. Now we rejoice that we don't have to live under a totalitarian regime. But how do we live as disciples of Jesus When those government decisions go against God's word? And how do we continue to stand when government or culture go against God, tries to replace God, or demands that we follow them rather than God? That's the crucial lesson we get to see in this chapter. And tonight all I want you to see is how the state, how Babylon made this transition to God, how the state became God. First, we get the scene set for us in verse 1 to 7. Nebuchadnezzar's experience in the previous chapter, which seemed so positive, is very short-lived. It hasn't affected him in the way that we hoped. That chapter ended with the king worshipping God, but it's so short-lived, and now his attention has turned back to his own ambitions. He's raised this giant statue on the plain of Dura. It's 30 feet tall and 3 feet, well, sorry, 30 meters tall, but in terms we all understand, and 3 meters wide. So it's this weird kind of skinny, gangly statue. And immediately our minds are taken back to chapter 2, aren't they, and that, that image from the dream. And it's hard to tell why Nebuchadnezzar is doing this. Some commentators think that he was quite proud of being the head of gold and is is showing off then. And and others, and I think this is perhaps a more compelling position, would suggest that he's actually a bit afraid of being replaced by this incoming second empire. And so he's consolidating his power, trying to beat the prediction and the prophecy trying to make himself and his kingdom something that's going to last forever and secure his place in history. But whatever the reason, the statue's erected, and then there's this huge dedication ceremony. He orders the attendance of every government official, verse 2 to 3. The king Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices and magistrates. You notice justices and magistrates? So not even the law of the land is above the worship of the king. There are going to be no checks and balances, no protection from a tyrant ruler. The law comes second to worshipping Nebuchadnezzar's image. Nothing to prevent corrupt leadership. Everything is going to bow to the authority of this image. And then to make sure that everybody's in a worshipful mood. An MC introduces the event in verse 4. A herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. And then the, the best orchestra in Babylon has been employed. That when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And I think the music there is significant. I've got a friend that I I grew up with and he's incredibly deadpan. And my parents, when we were growing up, would talk about him having a 
a personality transplant, you know, that kind of person just never gives anything away. And he told me once that he had to pull over in his car because the classical music playing on the radio was so beautiful he couldn't stop crying. And it just doesn't fit with this guy at all. But music moves even the, the most stoic people. A couple of years ago, there was a, a popular song called Blurred Lines. And it was about the ambiguity between rape and consent. And yet, because it had a catchy beat and a good rhythm, it was number one in 25 countries. Our emotions are stirred by music, and a good beat can anesthetize us to what a song is about. And so there's this music playing, there's this great announcement going out, we're watching a, a well-choreographed event. The valley's full of government officials. There's army officers, court advisors, all hearing this announcement, getting ready for the music so that they can bow to the golden image that's dominating the scene. And just to make sure of everyone's compliance, there's a threat. If you will not bow, you will burn. Verse 6, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Now we're going to come back to this next week, but, but what you need to know if you don't know the story for now is that despite the threat and despite the incredible pressure, three young Jews who hold important office in Babylon refuse to bow. And there's a company that specializes in, in surprise holidays. And so people will pay for a whole package and they don't know what they're going to get until the envelope comes through the door a couple of weeks before they're, they're set to go. And some people won't even open them until they get to the airport to increase the, the level of surprise. I, <laughs> I'd struggle to do that. You don't know what you're packing for or where you're going. When we just kind of glance across the scene here, it's hard to tell what this statue represents. It's only when we open the envelope, when we look into the passage more closely and more deeply, we get to see the purpose of this image. And I want you to see it in three R's. The first one is response. Look at verse 12. See, there's these advisors who are colleagues of these Jewish boys. And they see that they're not bowing to the king. I want you to imagine three, three brothers are playing rugby in the living room and Mum's told them to stop. And so the youngest one stops immediately and sits down, won't have any more to do with it. The game carries on. Eventually the boys get bored and they put the ball away and they're going to watch some TV. And as he goes to grab the remote, big brother trips and knocks a vase over and it smashes. Now little brother runs to tell mum. Now he could say, mum, there was an accident and your vase is broken. But if he really wants to cause some trouble, and youngest siblings usually do, <coughs> He could say, Mom, they just kept playing. They ignored you, and now your vase is broken. Now, that would not be lying, but it certainly would be twisting the truth, framing it in a way that suits him. But that also reveals what Mum's main concern is. See, she's not going to be so distressed about the vase or annoyed about that as she is about being disobeyed. Now these advisors say to Nebuchadnezzar, these men don't serve your gods. But that's sandwiched between two other things. They don't have to lie about that. They don't have to make anything up about these men not serving, not worshipping Nebuchadnezzar's God. Because that's not what's going to make Nebuchadnezzar mad. But look at what they say in the middle. These men pay no attention to you. Now that's just nonsense. They wouldn't have survived at court if they just didn't listen to anything the king said. But here we see Nebuchadnezzar's deepest need. It's revealed what's really going to make him angry. It's what this image is all about. Nebuchadnezzar isn't just creating another god to stuff into Babylon's crowded pantheon. It's all about him. It's his pride that gets hurt at the idea of these men not listening. It's his right to be adored that's being challenged. These Jews are not worshipping the golden image, they say, that you set up. The second R is reaction. Look at verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar is in a furious rage. 
He's not angry that they don't serve his gods. He already knew that from the previous chapter. Daniel made it quite clear that he was working for another god. But now they're not listening to him. See, it's all about Nebuchadnezzar. This whole thing exists purely for his glory, his worship. The king is making himself into a god. Then the last clue is that the, the king's heart, well, the last clue into the king's heart, the last thing that we see here, it, it's, not, it's not from the king or from somebody else. It's from the author, the person who's writing here. Did you notice as I, as I read this before, we read 18 verses and nine times, every other verse, actually twice in verse three, we get the words set up. We're being told constantly that this statue is set up by Nebuchadnezzar. And so this statue, is, it's got that one purpose. It's all about him. It's nothing to do with the statue. It's not about bowing down to the statue. It's who's behind the statue. And the author makes it plain. It's all about Nebuchadnezzar. He's making himself God. Now, I want you to see how far that goes because it's easy to say the king's making himself God. I want you to see the parallels here and, and it always makes me nervous when none of the commentators pick up on something like this but the parallels are clear and plain. So here we go, number one. Nebuchadnezzar demanded worship and that worship, verse four, was to come from all people and it would be a kind of worship that embraced all kinds of cultures. See, amongst the instruments that are listed there, some of them are Persian, some of them are Greek, and the horn and the pipe are Jewish instruments. And so just as Nebuchadnezzar has gathered to himself by conquest people from all nations, he's bringing those cultures into a melting pot in Babylon and bringing them all together now to worship him. It's all nations participating in worshiping Nebuchadnezzar. Now, God demands the worship of all creation. See the link? You see what I'm saying? Psalm 100, 150 verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And he doesn't exclude certain nationalities, but Revelation pictures worship in heaven as a great multitude no one could count from every tribe, nation, people, and language standing before the throne and the Lamb. Second parallel, Nebuchadnezzar was furious at refusal to worship. You see, he had planned this whole scene. He'd been daydreaming about what it was going to look like to have the whole valley of Dura bowing down to his image, his creation, worshipping him. And then he hears three Jews have ruined it. They've stopped it being perfect. It's only 99% of what he'd wanted. So they've robbed Nebuchadnezzar of, of his glory, of this scene that he had in his mind, and he was mad. The parallel's obvious. God is angry when people refuse to worship him. He warned Israel not to test him by giving his worship to idols. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, Exodus 34, 14. And the Lord Jesus in the same way was angry with the Pharisees. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God had asked them for heart worship, for love, but they refused to give it. They robbed God of his glory. Third parallel, Nebuchadnezzar punished those who refused to worship him. See, Babylon had expanded massively under his reign. More buildings meant more bricks. More bricks meant bigger furnaces. And, and we've all seen Bible book, picture, picture Bibles of, of furnaces that look a little bit like medieval furnaces made out of clay. The reality is it was probably a pit in the ground with some steps going down and just the fire would be started down there and more things could be thrown on top after that. So just like a fire pit, but we, we can't say for, for sure. Um, but this is his, uh, his furnace. And you can imagine the kind of fear that something like that would create. It's full of flame and smoke and power. It represents Nebuchadnezzar's strength as a builder. And it would become his justice now against anyone refusing to worship. And, and you notice also how Nebuchadnezzar demands the, the way that he is to be worshipped. 
He's the one who says what must be done. It wouldn't have been enough for, for Shadrach to say, oh, I'm really sorry, king, but I was just worshipping him in my own way, quietly in my heart. That would have landed him in the furnace too. He had to bow. Now God sets the way that he's worshipped. He says that the worship that he accepts is in spirit and in truth. That means from a heart that's made new by the Holy Spirit and worship that's in accordance with his word. That's what God is looking for. Anything less, even your own way of worshiping him will land you in hell forever. He is God. He decides how he's worshipped and anyone who refuses will face his wrath. I just want to read to you very quickly from Matthew chapter 13. Incredible words in parallel to this passage. Verse 49. Jesus is speaking about the end of time. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. That's what Jesus calls hell here. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see what I'm saying? Drawing these lines between Nebuchadnezzar and God. This isn't just an empty thing when I'm saying he's setting himself up as God. You know, He's literally doing that. Demanding worship. Setting the way he's to be worshipped. Furious when he's not worshipped. And repaying those who don't worship. Now imagine the question that most of us want to ask is, well, why is that okay for God? Why is it okay then for God to do that and not Nebuchadnezzar? Why can God demand worship and punish those who refuse, but when a man does it, he's a villain? And the answer is very simply because God is God. He's not a man. He is utterly pure. And he is holy and totally unique. And as I was preparing, there were a thousand answers to that question. Why is it right for God to do this? Just dangling on the tip of my pen, ready to write them down, and I could share them with you tonight. But the truth is the text deals with that question in a much more unusual and, if we're honest, awkward way. I would not answer that question how God answers the question. But he has the words of eternal life. And it's him that you've come to hear and not me. So why is it okay for God to demand worship and punish those who refuse? Three answers. The first two come with sarcasm. You believe that? From God's word come dripping with sarcasm. The first answer is this is okay for God because God never became God. See, why does the author repeat that word set up? again and again. Nine times, 18 verses, set up, set up, set up, set up. Because he wants to show you how silly it is that Nebuchadnezzar is trying to become God. See, a Jewish audience would read this about Nebuchadnezzar setting himself up, setting his image up, and would have to stifle a laugh because the very idea of becoming God proves you're not God. See, the God of the Bible was set up by no one. The one true and living God has always been, always is, and always will be. There's never a moment, not a fraction of a second in all of history when he was anything less than fully God. He's the great timeless, changeless I am. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The second answer that comes with sarcasm is that God doesn't manufacture worship. The second sarcasm is in those lists of officers and, and instruments that we read. Stuart Olliott says that um, if ever you found yourself smiling at these lists of prefects, governors, magistrates, satraps, pipes, liars, tigans, it's because you're supposed to. We're not meant to just sit there and think, oh yeah, no, there's another list. It's there for a reason. Repeated time and time again. It's saying, look at the lengths that Nebuchadnezzar would go to. All that pomp and procession 
And yet it's so empty. It's so forced. I read a great story about a Presbyterian missionary named Don McClure who was in, in the Sudan. And um, one of the missionary women that, that his team was with had thrown away an old corset. And they found out on Sunday morning that one of the chiefs had been rummaging through their bins because this man walked into church with a, an air of superiority, wearing this lovely used corset on his head and nothing else. <laughs> It's Nebuchadnezzar. He's gone to all this work. He thinks he's made himself something and there's nothing there. God doesn't manufacture worship. He doesn't bribe you into church with a coffee and a bagel and play emotive music that's going to give you the same buzz as you get at a concert. That's not the Holy Spirit movie. God speaks and people worship the spirit of God moves hearts and people worship the truth is preached and men and women worship by abandoning the things that they've been living for and change heart and mind towards God they live and by their living worship God see Nebuchadnezzar as king had a right to rule and to respect but not to worship. Only God deserves worship. And not only does he deserve it, but his nature demands it. Just as you can't look at the sun without shading your eyes. Nobody can see God and fail to worship. And so you think of Saul on the Damascus Road, meeting the Lord Jesus, falling off his donkey and worshipping. You think of John in Revelation and Daniel later in this book, meeting the Son of Man. You think of some temple soldiers come to arrest the Lord Jesus. And just three words, I am He. And they fall on their faces. There's this slither of His person that they see. A fraction of His divinity is revealed. Revelation and worship. Nebuchadnezzar did everything to make himself glorious, worshipful. He couldn't make three Jews bow. Why is it okay for God to receive worship? Because he's not a flawed, sin-ruined, broken, depraved, proud, petty, lusting, spiteful human. He is altogether different. He is pure, unbounded love. He is might and majesty and holiness. He's a consuming fire and he's light in whom there's no darkness. God is not a man. And until we get that into our heads, until we believe and think that, we'll always stumble on questions like this. Now the third answer is serious. The laughter fades, the sarcasm's gone and we're faced with a painful reality. God is not impotent in punishment. See, when Nebuchadnezzar tried to punish the men who refused to bow, he could not do it. And his furnace, the symbol of his might, and now his wrath, could not do it. Because Nebuchadnezzar is not the real power in the cosmos. And he could have all Babylon bowing, but that didn't make him God. Last week I was at Waipapa Point and watching these two sea lions really going for each other. You know, they're biting each other's necks and, and fighting each other, desperate to prove which one's the strongest. And they're just going for it until this sea lion that was about twice the size of the bigger one of the two comes roaring down the beach and they just scatter. They're out of there because their power is nothing compared to that one's. There is one true power in the universe and it's God. Look at verse 17. Look at what his people can say. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. There in Nebuchadnezzar's hand, he thinks he can do whatever he wants with them. He could just crush them like that. But he can't close his hand because God has moved. And when he moves, men are powerless, even the most powerful men. Even Nebuchadnezzar in his furnace could do nothing to God's people. He was impotent. 
but the power of God is never limitless. Let's apply this then. This is the awkward thing and, and it seems so hard for us when we first hear it, but I don't want to miss it. It's so important. It's so clearly here in this text. God laughs at the arrogance of men who set themselves up as God. And so when Soviet chairmen or Korean dictators or African generals make themselves or the state into something to be worshipped, and they hang the flags and they march the troops and they have the great patriotic speeches, you understand there is not a hint of concern in heaven. And though the whole world might be panicking and it might be taking up the news 24 hours a day, there is not a whiff of fear in heaven. And when they flex their muscles against God's people and they say you must stop meeting and you must stop worshipping and you must live and give to the state or suffer the consequences. There's no nervousness in God's heart that his people will come up against something that he can't save them from or supply grace for them in. See, God says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Having said that, the next thing I want to say is God grieves at the actions of men who set themselves up as God. I don't want you to think that the, the living God is heartless. And though he laughs at their empty arrogance, there's no laughter over what they do. There's no laughter at people being killed or lives ruined or laws being made. The creation sin grieves the creator and he will hold everyone accountable according to their works. And this is why you are commanded. Pray for your government. Pray for those in power. This is why when, when Mark prays each week, our nation has gone far from you. Though there might not be audible groans, there should be groans in our heart. Next on you need to see God will not be denied worship. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't make those three Jews bow, but when Jesus comes in judgment, not a single person will be standing. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And lastly, God will not fail to punish those who refuse to bow, who won't worship. And this is where we need to bring all of this down to a tiny point and apply it right into our hearts because it's not only nations that set themselves up against God, but individuals too. When we ignore God's word and turn our backs on the Lord Jesus and try and make our way through life without him, you're saying, I know best. I'm in charge. I've got the authority to decide how I live. I'm God here giving God's worship to you. Now Nebuchadnezzar could not punish Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego because a higher power saved them. Now what higher power will rescue you, sinner, from the hand of an angry God? Who would save you from the hell, from the furnace that he's prepared for those who refuse to worship? You know that the greatest difference between Nebuchadnezzar and God is grace. The, the one power able to prevent God from crushing you is God himself and he's provided a way for that not to happen. Not only is he a God of power and holiness and justice, but he's a God of grace. And at great cost to himself, he's made a way for us rebels to be saved. He sent his son into the world in, and then to the furnace of Calvary in our place. And he suffered your hell on the cross. And if you'd re repent of your sin, throw yourself on his mercy, God would forgive you. He'd give you a new heart fit for his worship. 
and for his company forever. And the last thing, the very, very last thing I want to say is that that worship that God has planned for himself is nothing like the kind of worship that Nebuchadnezzar had planned for Babylon. Imagine how dull and boring that would be. Waiting for the music to start so you can all bow down. The worship that God expects of his people, his first relationship. It's getting to know him and, and loving him and rejoicing in his company and learning more about him. And then it's relationship with his people that we might love one another. He brings us into this huge family that's so multifarious and from different backgrounds to help each other and love each other. And, and it's mission as well. As worship, he's given us work to do that's of eternal value. And we could spread it out to the, the most widely encompassing word of just life. That every aspect of everything we do every day is to be worship, our work and our friendship and our hobbies. All of these things can be used for glorifying God. What a great God he is. How petty and small he makes Nebuchadnezzar look. Let's pray to him.